want is to pitch into this fabulous conversation that, that we've all heard yesterday and taken part in. Um, and, you know, th this is a complex world, and so every little bit of thinking and intelligence and information that we can add to it, I think, is useful. And I think some of the things I'm going to say are controversial, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do five things. Um, one is I'm going to explain why I chose this title, Can Europe Hold the Fort? And then I'm going to make four points. Um, the first point is um, uh, about the challenges that Europe faces and how they relate to US foreign policy. The second point is to say that the news of Europe's death or its demise is exaggerated. And in a, in a de demonstration of Franco-British friendship, I'm going to challenge some of the things that um, Matthew Goodwin said yesterday in his excellent presentation. Um, my, third, my, my third point is that um, I will try to answer that question briefly. And I'll say that Europe can hold part of the fort, but certainly not all of it. And I believe the US will need Europe not just the other way around in the future. My, my last point will be hopefully a little, uh, a little uplifting. Personalities matter. The personalities of leaders matter um, immensely. You know that. You know that. We know that in Europe as well. We know that in Europe as well. And I'll just add to that that citizens matter. Citizens' engagement matters immensely. And this is one of the great things that I've discovered about this conference is that it's all about citizens' engagement. So um, all you young guys out there interested in foreign affairs, keep, that, you know, keep your interest up because the world is going to need your energy and your thinking and your creative thinking. Um, so why did I choose this, t this title? The fort is not Europe itself. That's not my understanding of that word. The fort is the rules-based international liberal order. It's what Avril Haines yesterday called treaties and how they can affect our lives in ways that we don't always think about. And this order is being undermined by Trump, but not just Trump. This, this, this sentence, actually, I didn't think it up. I was in a discussion in, in, uh, in, in Europe five months into Trump's presidency with uh, European officials and experts. It was a think tank discussion, and, uh, and a former Obama administration official was there. And he said the following thing, thing to, to those Europeans uh, around the table. And I'm going to read what I wrote, the notes I took that day. The US is a resilient country. We will be back. The task, the task for Europe is to hold down the fort, to keep the momentum of Western-built institutions and values moving forward until we are back. Trump is a painful aberration, and he could last some time yet. But during that period, it's Europe's moment. Now, that really got me thinking, and I think I've been thinking about this ever since. At the end of May 2017, Angela Merkel, walked into a beer hall in Munich, and she was campaigning. And she told the audience that Europe, that it was time for Europe to, and I quote, take our fate into our hands. She said, the era in which we could fully rely on others is somewhat over. Those two words are important, fully rely and somewhat over. And she said, that's what I have experienced over the past several days. She had just had her third encounter with Donald Trump. That was, that was at a G7 summit in Hamburg. And that, those were her words after that third meeting. A, a little bit later, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is a big, big German newspaper, wrote um, that Angela's Mer Angela Merkel's statement that day proclaimed Europe's emancipation from America. Now, why does this? This matters to me. All of this matters to me. Why am I so you know, geeky about European affairs and international security? I think it all goes back to we all have our personal stories and why we're interested in foreign policy. I was a student in Paris when the Berlin Wall fell down. Um, I was 23. And what I did when I saw those pictures, I jumped on a train. I took a night train to Berlin. And I wanted to see it. I wanted to, to see it. So I, I went there, and I saw those young East Berliners 
chipping away with chisels and hammers at that wall, you know, and, 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 and with, with absolute joy. It was, it was like a party. And then, and then they were selling pieces of the wall. <laughs> uh, and, and what I did is I, I bought a pair of earrings made of chunks, small chunks of the wall with paint on them, and that was the paint of graffitis that had been accumulated over two decades, and they, they were pretty heavy earrings. Um, and the Berlin Wall, I just wanted to remind you, the Berlin Wall stood for 28 years, two months, and 28 days, exactly. On February 7th, just 11 days ago, uh, exactly 28 years, two months and 28 days had passed since the wall came down. So this month, the Berlin Wall uh, has ceased to exist for longer than it actually existed. 1989 feels like another era now. But I will never forget the excitement and the emotion of those at that time in, in our lives, in, in when, when Germany and Europe's reunification became possible. It's in Berlin that I decided that my beat as a journalist would be to cover the transformations of the wider Europe. So that took me further east, naturally. I, I went to Russia. I, I, I witnessed the Yeltsin years. I witnessed the um, early four or five years of Putin. And one of the things I learned uh, as I covered some of, the, some of the events going on, including the war in Chechnya, is, that, is, is how deeply, um, in deeply intertwined the Putin regime is with war. Um, I also, and, and I want to say that because as, as you're grappling in this country with, with the issue of Russian meddling, um, we, we in Europe um, have, have had quite some experience with that already um, for quite some time. I just want to remind you that the first, the first comprehensive uh, cyber attack aimed at paralyzing the institutions of an entire country happened in 2007. It was a Russian cyber attack, and it happened in 2007 in Estonia. And this is a country where voting, Estonia is a country where voting is entirely electronic. Another thing that I learned in all those years traveling across Europe is how deeply connected post-Cold War Europe's destiny has been to US foreign policy choices just as in the 20th century, Europe's destiny had in so many ways been defined by US engagement on the continent or lack of engagement. After World War I, the US Congress refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, which founded the League of Nations. That's the predecessor of the UN. That was the first sign of isolationism, which cost all of us dearly. The European project is 60 years old. It turned 60 last year. Um, it would have been impossible. It would never have been possible without US commitment, without the US security umbrella, which, which did more than protect us. It actually created the very conditions for co cooperation and reconciliation among our wide, complex tapestry of European nations. Europe, it's true, has been a free rider for seven decades. It could never have coped without that US role. Before we get into discussions, perhaps on you know, defense spending targets, the 2% of GDP target, I wanted, to, I wanted to remind you of that historical backdrop. And now I'm going to get to, to um, my, my, first, my first point, which is about the challenges that Europe faces today and how they, are relate, related to, to, they, how they relate to US foreign policy. And I, I decided I would, I'm going to try to. <laughs> I decided I would use this poster, um, which you haven't seen before. <laughs> um, and it just, to, just to remind you, when I, saw this, when I saw this illustration, I thought, this is great, because it's, it says you know, a lot of what I'm trying to say, actually. Would you, there, there are hardly any of the elements on this, on this um, illustration that, that don't relate to Europe. Um, you know, um, obviously, there's the, there's the Euro. There's the Euro uh, bank, uh, well, m single, single currency right there. Um, China is a, a growing factor in Europe. Um, the Middle East, uh, here, destruction, I suppose this is in Syria. The Middle East is, is a big factor in Europe. Putin, uh, you know, n not, no need to get into, into that entirely now. 
And even here, and Erdogan, of course, in Turkey, this is a big factor in Europe as well, not just on migration issues, also on domestic, domestic European politics. And here, this, 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 this guy matters to Europe as well because he's part of, he's part of the unraveling or the, or the dangers that, that lie that, that um, the international liberal order is, is faced with. Um, he is part of uh, a lifting of taboos and of conventions and treaties um, um, being in danger of coming undone. Um, yesterday, there were interesting parallels made between the US, the UK, and continental Europe. I hate to say the UK and Europe. I say the UK and continental Europe, because I'm still hoping that somehow this crazy mess of Brexit can be stopped. To our degree, it's, it's true our democracies suffer from civil, similar woes. Um, there's distrust in the elites. There's middle class disgruntlement in the face of globalization. Disruptions that come from uh, technological, the technological revolution. Fake news, uh, Indira and I, uh, I'm sure, spent a lot of time thinking about that. Mainstream politics um, has been, have been hollowed out and replaced by radical discourses both on the left and on the right. The poet, uh, as the poet said, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Or if you want to quote Antonio Gramsci, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. We live in that era. But there's also something else that's very specific to Europe, and this is, this is why this illustration is, is, is very useful, and, this, and it's why uh, and it's something that sets Europe apart from the US and to a degree from the UK. And that has to do with geography. Europe is on Russia's doorstep. Europe is on the doorstep of the Middle East. It is on the doorstep of North Africa. And all these places are sources of instability, uncertainty. The US is not on those doorsteps. Europe was supposed to export, be able to export stability, but instead what's happened in recent years is that instability and chaos have spilled into Europe from the outside. You can choose your friends, you can choose your allies, sometimes, uh, sometimes not, you can choose your adversaries, but you never choose your geography. US policies in the Middle East have had an impact on Europe in ways that I believe few US policymakers ever cared to anticipate. Trump is, of course, bad news for Europe. He dislikes the, the European Union. He, he only, I think, went there because he has a golf course in Scotland. Uh, he, call, he called the European Union a vehicle for Germany. He applauded Brexit. He called NATO obsolete. And his speech in Warsaw last year was a, a, an immense boon to nativist, white, nationalist forces all over. Uh, but most of the shocks that have affected Europe predated Trump, in fact. The Eurozone and the debt crisis, Ukraine, 2014. The refugee crisis, it peaked in 2015. Brexit, 2016. And the series of terrorist attacks in Brussels, Copenhagen, Paris, Nice, Berlin, Stockholm, Barcelona. I want to, make, I want to say a word about Syria because I think, I, I think it's an immensely important issue. Syria is a European crisis as well as a Middle Eastern crisis. And it's, of course, I believe, the, the world's worst human, human rights disaster in decades, half a million deaths. It is also far from over. Syria was the biggest cause of the refugee crisis that up upended European politics. Obama's U-turn on red lines in Syria in August of 2013 had immense consequences. There is a case to be made that in the summer of 2013, a window of opportunity was lost as a result of American hesitations. Historians may one day tell us to what degree we in the West wasted a chance to push Bashar al-Assad towards the negotiating table for, 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 settled, for settlement deal by, using, by, exer by exerting sufficient pressure on his forces through targeted strikes. That is how Milosevic uh, was forced to sign the Dayton uh, Agreement in, in 1995, which put an end to mass atrocities in Bosnia. Some European officials believe that it was the American failure to uphold red lines in Syria that emboldened Putin to act in Ukraine. 
and then to launch his own military intervention in Syria in support of a dictator whose army had been busy massacring civilians since 2011. I'm not saying this to whitewash European policies. British abstention on Syria predated Obama's, and the French could not do anything alone. European choices in the run-up to the war in Ukraine can be debated as well. I won't get into that just now. Still, it's important to connect some of the dots in this complex triangle between the Middle East, Europe, Russia, and how the US chose to act or not to act. The return of war on the European continent, as well as, uh, as, well as the spillover of Middle Eastern chaos, are developments whose full, bl full blow uh, is yet to be measured. A few questions that I ask myself, um, would Brexit have happened without those images of hundreds of thousands of refugees trekking across European borders, pictures that were immediately exploited by Nigel Farage? Perhaps, perhaps not. Would terrorist acts in Europe, uh, some of them on a military scale, as in Paris in January of 2015 and November of 2015, would they have been carried out without the killing fields of Syria and how ISIS was allowed to set up a caliphate there from which it planned attacks? Marine Le Pen's rise in France had many causes. But in the run-up to last year's presidential election in my country, French officials were terrified that another massive terrorist attack on the eve of the second round might dramatically boost her chances. Russian meddling at that point was a lesser concern. This all sounds very bleak, so now I'm gonna to get to my third point, which is the, the, good, the, the good news, in my view, is that news of Europe's demise is exaggerated. And I, I, I welcome that map of Europe. It doesn't, this one doesn't have the EU, but later we'll have the EU on it. Um, so news of Europe's demise is, is, is exaggerated. Look at, um, look at what so many Cassandras had predicted but did not happen. Grexit did not happen. The last thing the Greeks wanted, whatever the flaws of Eurozone governance, the last thing they wanted was to get out of the EU. <laughs> The, the collapse of the Eurozone did not happen. Le Pen did not happen. A Brexit domino effect has not happened. Uh, on another point, but I can make the list longer, a, a, a collapse of EU uh, sanctions policies on Russia has not happened. And yet there were many concerns and questions about that. To be sure, there are very worrisome de developments uh, still and flashpoints. Poland. Poland was once a trailblazer of democratic transition. Uh, and now it looks like a trailblazer in the other direction, alongside Hungary's Orban, Viktor Orban, with his theories about illiberal democracy. The far right in Austria is now in the governing coalition, and it, control, it controls key ministries, defense, foreign ministry, and interior. But in none of these countries is there serious talk of leaving the EU. One of the paradoxes of Poland is that however strained its, re its relations with EU institutions right now, popular support for, the, for EU membership in Poland is currently one of the highest in Europe. Italy is a country where support for the EU has dropped to low levels, but no one is in Italy is campaigning ahead of these March 4 elections. No one is in Italy is campaigning on leaving the EU. Even, even the five-star uh, anti-establishment movement. Last, year, last month, they, they gave up on that slogan. They, they, they rolled back and said, no, in fact, we don't want to leave the Eurozone. Um, be why? Because they know that voters don't want that, uh, and they want to appear fit to govern. Brexit, it's true, is the first time a member of the club pulls out of it or wants to. It's a major event. But Brexit will not be a model for how uh, countries leave the EU. On the contrary, it is turning into a model of what goes wrong when you choose to leave the EU. To say Emmanuel Macron is already on the losing side, and here, this is a little uh, peek for, for Matthew, is a bit hasty. He's been in office for eight months. Let's give him a chance. So far, the French are giving him a chance to carry out much needed and hopefully job-creating reforms. Germany has over 90 far-right politicians in its parliament. Merkel is weakened, and she may only stay for one part of her uh, fourth tenure as, as chancellor. But if the coalition deal with the Social Democrats is confirmed, and we'll know that on March 4th, 
then that does create an opening for a stronger Franco-German engine at the heart of Europe. For years, when the US asked itself which number to dial to call Europe, you know, to quote that uh, phrase attributed to Henry Kissinger, that the answer was Merkel's number. But now there's another number available, and it's, it's in, the, in the Elysee Palace. My, my final point is, and I wanted to please have the map. This is, so this is, this is the European Union. The European Union is written in Russia right there, so it's very optimistic, but, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but okay, you understand the colors. Um, so um, my final point is, um, uh, my fourth point, sorry, is that Europe can hold, hold part of the fort, but it certainly cannot hold all of it. European leaders are right now um, trying to deepen and showcase a degree of defense cooperation. There's a lot of symmetry. There's been a lot of symmetry. Um, a European defense fund is being set up, and there's talk of a permanent structured cooperation. Um, this, is not, this is not done to please Donald Trump. It is a step towards addressing some of the new realities of Europe's deteriorated security environment. There are also efforts to strengthen the EU's external borders and their efforts to produce a workable, common asylum and immigration policy. All this is complex. Um, and there's also a push to jumpstart um, enlargement, the enlargement process towards, towards the Balkans. You see that hole still there in, 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 in that part of Europe. But let's not fool ourselves. Um, there, is, there is no plan B. When you talk about defense and European defense, there is no plan B uh, for European defense guarantees that would ever be an alternative to NATO. There, it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a new, an EU or European nuclear deterrent. Uh, there is no such thing as an equiv a EU equivalent to Article 5. The EU remains a vegetarian organization in a world of carnivores. <laughs> Uh, which, which doesn't mean it is toothless, um, um, but one of the big unknowns remains Germany's attitude towards hard power, towards defense, and, and its responsibilities in that realm. Um, history continues to loom large in Europe. Um, Germany's foreign minister, Sigmar Gabriel, recently told the Spiegel magazine, do we truly believe that our European neighbors would be pleased to see an enormous army arising in Germany in 10 years' time. So what does this all mean for the US? The US will have a choice to make in this era of global disorder. Does it want to stand alone, or does it need partners and allies? Trump has not broken NATO, nor has he backtracked on commitments made by Obama to strengthen Europe's eastern flank. But a wider question is at play. And it is whether the US even values what Europe has to offer. With the US presidency turning its back on multilateralism, Europe is today the last remaining defender of a rules-based liberal international order. Russia and China are not. Europe is where the US can find, if it looks for it constructively, support on key international uh, challenges, anti-terrorism, development, managing the rise of China, non-proliferation, climate change. When the US and the Europeans work side by side, things can get done. Think the nuclear deal on Iran. The US may not be at all interested in Europe's input, but then, it will be that bit more isolated in the world. Trump's popularity ratings in Europe are comparable to those of today, are comparable to those of George W. Bush towards the end of his presidency. 22% of Britons hold a favorable uh, opinion of Trump. 14% of the French, 11% in Germany have a favorable opinion of, of Trump. 7% of people in Spain. There are two risks attached to this. The first is the rise of anti-Americanism, not just anti-Trumpism in Europe, in particular in Germany, whose Western anchoring, it's called Westbindung, uh, could start cracking at the seams. And the second is a phenomenon of European hedging, a kind of balkanization of Europe, in which countries start turning towards the highest bidder, playing on rivalries among powers like Russia, China, Turkey, 
My last point is, is the personalities matter. Leaders, the le personalities of leaders matter. It's not just the economy. Macron just turned 40 years old. <laughs> Uh, he got elected without ha ever having elect, uh, held elected office. He, he reached the presidency without any experience whatsoever of, of being elected. And without the support of any established party, uh, traditional party. Uh, this sets him aside, by the way, from Trump, who's, who did need the support of a, a major party to get, to get to the presidency. Macron was lucky, but he also demonstrated an, an astute understanding of France's 1980, uh, 1958 constitution. I can get into that later if you're interested. Macron wants to make France shine again <laughs> by restoring a leadership role for the country in Europe. He calls himself a progressive, and he has no sympathy whatsoever for Trump. But to say he is the anti-Trump would be simplistic. He's trying to work with Trump, pragmatically, in fact, as much as he's trying to oppose him. Anti-terrorism is a French priority. That crushing handshake, you remember those pictures of Macron and Trump, you know, um, that, that manly handshake, um, was, for all the comments made about it, it was a handshake. <laughs> Merkel and Macron have a double act going on. Merkel is on the record saying, Germany cannot be strong without a strong Europe and Europe cannot be strong without a strong France. But Merkel and Macron's plans for Europe right now uh, suffer from uncertainties, the uncertainties of German politics. It was also strange when I think back to that moment when Merkel was speaking in that beer hall that she, showed, she, she, she chose Munich um, to, to talk about that, <laughs> that break with America. Um, it seemed like an uncharacteristic moment of carelessness for a leader who has the mind of a scientist uh, and who, who, who pays a lot of attention to detail. Later, she tried to correct this. Uh, she, she, she seemed to express discomfort with, with, with the way her words had been interpreted, and she said it was absurd to describe her as the leader of the free world. Barack Obama once called himself the first U.S. Uh, president, uh, the first Pacific American president. Um, and that's, that said something not just about himself, but about the way the world is changing, Trump or no Trump. Merkel, in that beer hall, um, was the first German chancellor to ever suggest the notion of a post-American Europe, of post-American uh, Europe, uh, Germany. <laughs> Uh, a chancellor in that, in that reality. Um, and she's also the first German chancellor whose tenure is entirely in the 21st century. Her predecessor, you know, was, was there from 97 to 2005, Schroeder. So it, these, are, these are striking things when you think about personalities because Merkel is somebody who grew up behind the Iron Curtain, um, who was in Berlin the day, that day the Berlin Wall fell, and the next day with her sister she went to the Kufurstendam, uh, uh, you know, uh, shopping district to, to look at what, what, what people could buy there. Um, and her biographer, uh, Stefan Cornelius, um, uh, wrote that when she, was, when she was young and growing up behind the, the Iron Curtain, she dreamt of visiting the U.S. more than any other part of the world, including Western Europe. So her words did signal a change. Um, I want to go back just to, for the last minute to that, that poster, the, the illustration. Look at Merkel's expression. <laughs> that basically uh, sums up what I'm trying to say. Um, it's, it's the expression of a European disarray. What's to become of this? What's to become of us with this man? Um, but it also suggests that there are things that can't be taken for granted anymore so easily. Um, and that the way the US has at times benefited from European solidarity, European cooperation, is, is no longer guaranteed either. As unbalanced as Europe's power may be compared to the US's, uh, um, I believe that interests, hardcore interests, whether they're, they're defined as national interests or as pan-European, continental-wide interests will dictate positions, not necessarily old friendships. But I'm here to talk, I hope, a little bit more with you about those friendships. Thank you very much. Thank you.